Is it any wonder that we're afraid of death when we have it dressed this way? Huh? Is it any wonder that 83% of Canadians do not have their wills done? Is it any wonder that any of us in here likely don't have our advanced care directives done? Or our representation agreements? Is it any wonder that the medical system fears death and holds it as the enemy and a sign of failure? Any wonder that we spend 25% of our health care budget on 5% of the people in the last 10 months of their life. Imagine. Perhaps I'm why. Everybody take a deep breath in, please. Deep breath. Breathe this image of death in. Feel it. Take another deep breath in. Feel it again. Feel this dark, this dreary, this somber, grim reaper. And this time when I ask you to take a deep breath in, I want you to exhale, close your eyes, and let go of me. But take a deep breath in. Big exhale. Eyes closing. What would happen if we just got it wrong? What would happen if death were actually creative? perhaps warm. What would happen if death were actually welcomed back to life as a fundamental and important facet of living? Everybody take a deep breath in. Big exhale and open your eyes. What would happen if death walked into your life looking a bit like this. Bright. Colorful. Alive. Vital. What would happen if death weren't the Grim Reaper, but were in fact an inspirational teacher? Would we stuff our elders away in seniors' homes? They're dying for volunteers to come and sit with them? No. We do that because we're frightened of death. We don't want to be sitting too close to it in case it's contagious. Well, tough luck, you all got the disease. (laughs) Ain't nobody getting out of here. Nobody's getting out of here alive. And the moment we can come to grips with death in this very body, this very life, is the moment we are free to live. And I'm going to give you some examples, if I may tell you a couple of stories. I've been a cremationist, I've been a hospice volunteer, I've done all kinds of crazy stuff with death and dying. And my life is way more rich because I'm not afraid of it. My life is way more rich because I sit with those of us who are passing and I listen to them and I hear what they have to say. And I get downloads of their wisdom over and over and over again. I was on shift in Langley Hospice back in BC. 12-bed hospice, crazy busy. Two nurses on staff only. I'm a volunteer. The place is going crazy. It's Sunday night. All the families have gone home. The buttons are being pushed. It's like a beeper orchestra in the hospice. People want help all over the place. Nurse runs by me and says, Stephen, can you go and see Mrs. Smith? She's like close to death and she's freaking out and we haven't got time to help her. I said, sure. So I walk up to Mrs. Smith's room and I feel what's going on in there and she's breathing rapidly and I can feel the fear in her breath. So I walk in, I thought, well, what to do? So I slid my arm underneath her frail little body and I pulled her close and I put her chest, her back close to my chest. I put my arms around, just held her. And I used my slow, deep breathing to help her settle. I just breathed with her for a few minutes. Deep, slow breaths and she started to settle in a little bit. And I took my hand, I just stroked her head and cuddled her a little bit and put my hand on her tender face and just held her. Her breath started to calm and she started to relax a little bit. And as she relaxed, I just lay her back in her bed of pillows and I sat beside her and we just held hands. She was out cold, but we just held hands, her and I, 15, 20 minutes. 
And I knew Mrs. Smith a fair bit. I visited her a few times before. I knew her husband really well. They're deep lovers. Married 68 years. She was 86, you know? It's phenomenal. We had kind of a humorous friendship, she and I. So she woke up a little bit, and she opened her eyes, and she looked over at me. And she said, Ah, Stephen, it's you. I said, Yeah, who are you expecting, the Grim Reaper? We had a good little laugh about that, because she was kind of wacky. And then she went to sleep again for a couple of minutes. I just kept on stroking her hand, just being with her and just loving her. That's all the guy can do. Nothing else to do. She came to again and she said, Stephen, can I tell you something? I said, you sure can. She said, you know, my husband and I really love each other, don't you? I said, yes, it's obvious to me. She said, well, I always held 5% back. And I don't think I should have done that. And then she fell asleep again. And I just patted her hand and said goodnight. And she died two hours later. What I did with that deathbed regret, because I'm still alive, is I thought, holy shit. I don't want to be sitting on my deathbed with my brother over there sitting beside me, and I'm going to him. Bro, you know what? I held my love back. So I went out to my car. I got my notepad out, and I wrote down a list. Who am I holding my love back from? Because I don't want to go to my deathbed having regrets. My wife was on the top of the list. Because sometimes wives are a little hard for us guys to deal with. Then there was my mother-in-law, because she's kind of a bit like my wife. And then there was my own mother. And then there was my brother and, and my two boys. And on this deathbed regret that this woman shared with me, I made an oath that I would love those people even more. Because I didn't want to be on my deathbed regretting it. My wife's a lot happier now. My boys are going, Dad, you don't have to say I love you so much. Can you back off a little bit? (laughs) Lesson number one, death taught me. Don't wait to love. Love your asses off now. Because on your deathbed, you're going to frickin' regret it if you haven't. That's story number one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a question of all of you guys. I want you to raise your hand to say yes. How many here are committed to love even more and more recklessly because of this story? Okay, I know the Grim Reaper. I know how to find you in your dreams. I'll come and get you if you don't. (laughs) Story number two, if I may. My boy Oliver took a sound engineering course in Vancouver. He's 21. He had a friend who was taking the course with him who's 20, young man. He made his money to pay for the course by being a janitor at a grow-up. Not a very clever idea. Made lots of money, but at the end of the day, this young man got shot to death by a gang mob at the age of 21. My boy's class of 12 young men was destroyed by this tragic and nasty death. My son came home, and he was visibly upset, and we just sat on the couch, and he put his head on my shoulder. He just cried his ass off. Just really felt so helpless with him. My art form wasn't so good with him, though. I was a bit too hasty because I have high standards for my boys. I said to him, Oliver, somewhere in here there's a gift for you. Can you just look for the gift in this boy's death? And he told me to fuck off. (laughs) He said, how dare you? How dare you have me look for a gift in my buddy's death? You're an asshole. And he stormed out of the house. God bless him for being so honest. Two weeks went by. He never spoke to me for two weeks. Then on the second week, in the 15th day, he came up, came up the stairs, and he said, Dad, can I see you for a minute? I said, sure. And he just fell into my arms, and he had another good cry. He said, Dad, I took your advice. I looked for the gift, and you know what? I found it. I always thought I had a tomorrow, he said to me. He's 21. I always thought I had a tomorrow. My friend demonstrated that maybe I don't. So just in case, Oliver said, I'm going to live my ass off every day and I will not put off anything until tomorrow that I can do today. I've watched him for over a year. That young man has not put one thing off. He works his ass off as a horticulturalist during the day to make money so he can do his passion, which is to produce music at night. Gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning, works all day, gets home. First thing he does, gets on his soundboard, makes music, makes beats, he goes to sleep at 12 o'clock. He's living his passion and living his life because his friend taught him not to hold back. Gift number two from death. Live your ass off. Just in case, just in case 
you don't have a tomorrow. I kiss my wife every time I leave to go traveling, just in case the plane crashes, and she loves the kisses. How many of you think you got it tomorrow? Raise your hands. Be honest. We all think we got it tomorrow. What happens if you don't? Have you given yourself fully this day? Have you really lived your ass off this day? So that's lesson number two. Live your ass off. So you love like crazy and you live your ass off. Lesson number three. This is a very personal story to me. I used to be a stockbroker. I had lots of money. I had lots of hair. I had... <laughs> I had ping golf clubs, man. I had a one iron that I couldn't hit. I had slash and squash rackets. I had a Ford Recur XR4TI sports car, five speed all synchro overdrive. I had a briefcase. I had wingtip shoes and I had horn rim glasses. I had the American dream aced. And was I ever proud of it? May the 5th, 1988, Thursday evening, 6 32. My phone's ringing off the hook. It was one of those calls. You ever have your phone ringing and you think, ah, oh, shit, this is the call? I had that feeling in my body. I get a call. It's my sister Jody's husband. He said to me, Jody's gone. I thought, and I said, where, Mexico? He said, no, Jody's gone. Then the phone dropped to the floor. His mom picked it up and said, your sister died. And I was shattered. Shattered that God would choose my gracious, creative, wacky, generous sister and leave me on the planet. I got my ass down on the floor and I was begging to God. I said, God, I'll give you my ping golf clubs because you're the only guy who can hit a bloody one iron. God said, "Uh uh-uh, no way. My slash into your squash racket, 250 bucks, it's graphite. I don't play squash, said God. My RSPs, my stock bonuses, take my sports car. Give me my fucking sister back, I said. God said, no way. All the things I had worked for in my life were worth zero. Because I couldn't get my sister back. I was so pissed off. And I thought about it a little bit. I got some therapy a little bit. And I spent some time with my sister's death. What does that mean to me? There's got to be a gift here somewhere. And then I realized, holy shit, I don't want to be a stockbroker. I want to be a social worker. I want to be an author. I want to be a speaker. I want to help people. To hell with the damn money. I remember as I lowered my sister's body into the ground, I said, I'm going to figure out what this life and death shit is all about because I don't get it. On her deathbed, I made a commitment. I'd find out. And I have found out. I've gone and done my work. I quit my job. I was making a billion dollars a year. I made more money in a month than most people make in three years. So I quit. I became a social worker. And now here I am. If my sister had not have died, I would not be here today. I miss her deeply, profoundly. I love to hug her. I wear crazy socks. Look at these things. Ooh, yellow socks. I wear crazy socks because Jody wore crazy socks. But to this day, I am grateful and have deep gratitude for her passing because her death breathed life into me. I got my life back from my sister's dying. She didn't know it. She just died. But how I took it was, wow, there's got to be a gift here. With death, please take on the belief that There's got to be birth somewhere if there's been a death. We're on a bipolar planet, north, south, right, wrong, good, bad. Death, birth. Whenever there's a death, there's got to be a birth somewhere. There's got to be a gift somewhere. Has to be. This is what we miss when we grieve, is we don't bring balance to our grieving. It's all black and dark and somber. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's everything right with that. But we've got to bring the light side with it too. So the grief is healthy and balanced, and everybody leaves a gift behind. I have not seen one death where the close family and friends have not been gifted by that very death. Even a six-month-old baby that I cremated. Six months old, the parents just got her. And she was dead. You can't make sense of that, can you? But you can make meaning. At this six-month 
old baby's cremation, there were 454 people in the funeral chapel. Nurses, doctors, administrators, family and friends. There was so much love in that room that was created by that six-month-old baby. The gift for the parents, and they said it to me three weeks later, our daughter, our six-month-old daughter, taught us the importance of love. Six-month-old, there was a gift there. The mother and the father learned to love even more deeply at the loss of their daughter. So what do you think? Am I full of shit? (laughs) What happens... What happens if we can laugh in public about death? What happens if we can talk about it in public? What happens if it's not taboo? What happens if it's an important facet of life that we can grow by, that we can learn from, that we can be inspired by? What happens if I'm right? How would your life change? How would you look at death? Would you leave an elder sitting in a goddamn room all by herself or all by himself with nobody to talk to to help them make meaning of their life? I think what we should do is change the name of all those care homes and seniors' homes, extended homes, where we send our elders. We should call them wisdom libraries. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Everybody in that home who agrees should have a library card that says, this is my name, this is my life experience, and this is what I can teach. Somebody come and take me out for a coffee. And we take them out for a coffee. Put it on Facebook. Every care home could have a Facebook page for their living wisdom books. Why couldn't we do that? I suggested to a lady in Castlegar, and she's doing it. We could make those changes if we weren't so frightened of death. Death sits on my right shoulder, right here, and reminds me every day how lucky I am to be alive on this planet. I do a gratitude tap dance every time I get out of bed. Oh, I'm still here. How awesome is that? Because I don't take my life for granted because I've seen so much death. So if we could all just get over the idea that the Grim Reaper is real. We just made him up. We just made him up for a whole bunch of reasons. I won't bother going into them tonight. If we made up the Grim Reaper, we can unmake him. And perhaps, although my wife would hate my color combinations, perhaps... This could be a representation of death. Just perhaps. Nice bow tie. Nice bright yellow shirt. Nothing grim about me. Would you sit with me? Or Thank you. Or would you sit with this? Your choice. <laughs> Only for my sister, brother. Only for Jody. God bless her. So my request of you, I'm on a mission. And my mission is to change the conversation North Americans don't have about death to change our fear-based denial of something fundamentally important to the human existence, of allowing death and welcoming death back into our lives. Let it be here with us. Give it space. Don't have to encourage it. I'm not rushing death to come. I'm saying, hey, buddy, not yet. I've got a lot of talking to do. I've got half half a billion conversations to have. What I'd like you all to do is allow me to enroll you as a new inspirational teacher advocate that we're going to push away the Grim Reaper. I would encourage each and every one of you to do just that. Because you'll be amazed, my dear friends, at how much more alive you'll feel in your life if you're not frightened of death. One last word. Have I got time? I'm out of time. Shit. One last word. Anybody here a little bit resistant to change or risk-taking? Okay. Fear of death. The seed of risk-taking... The fear of it is death. Something was and won't be. My reputation was and won't be. All right? Robin Williams passed away. My generation. God damn it, I was pissed off at him for killing himself. But he was a brilliant philosopher. His movie, Patch Adams, inspires me to this very day. So let's remember Robin Williams as Mork and Mindy. Nanu, Nanu. Thanks for listening, my friends. God bless you.